Part six, chapter nineteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part six, chapter nineteen. The town of Peel was in a great commotion that night. It was the night of St. Patrick's Day, and the mackerel fleet were leaving for Kinsale. A hundred and fifty boats lay in the harbour each with a light in its binnacle, a fire in its cabin, smoke coming from its stove-pipe, and its sails half set. The sea was fresh, there was a smart breeze from the northwest, and the air was full of the brine. At the turn of the tide the boats began to drop down the harbour. Then there was a rush of women and children, and old men to the end of the pier. Mothers were seeing their sons off, women their husbands, children their fathers, girls their boys, all full of fun and laughter and joyful cries. One of the girls remembered that the men were leaving the island before the installation of the new governor. Straightway they started a game of make-believe, the make-believe of electing the governor for themselves. Who are you voting for, Mr. Quayle? Oh, Dempster Christian, of course. Throw us your rope, then, and we'll give you a pull. Heave, oh, girls, and the rope will be whipped round a mooring-post on the quay. Twenty girls would seize it, and the boat would go slipping past the pier, round the castle rocks, and then away before the northwester like a gull. Good luck, Harry. Whips of money coming home, Jim. Write us a letter, mind you're right now. Good night, father. No crying yet, no sign of tears, nothing but fresh young faces, bright eyes and peals of laughter, as one by one the boat slid out into the fresh green water of the bay and the wind took them, and they shot into the night. Even the dogs on the quay frisked about, and barked as if they were going crazy with delight. In the midst of this happy scene, a man wearing a monkey jacket and a wide-brimmed soft hat came up to the harbour with a little misshapen dog at his heels. He stood for a moment as if bewildered by the strange midnight spectacle before him. Then he walked through the throng of young people, and listened a while to their talk and laughter, no one spoke to him, and he spoke to no one. His dog followed with its nose at his ankles. If some other dog, in youthful frolic, frisked and barked about it, it snarled and snapped, and then croodled down at his master's feet and looked ashamed. Dempster, Dempster, getting a bit old, eh? said the man. After a little while he went quietly away. Nobody missed him. Nobody had observed him. He had gone back to the town. At a baker's shop, which was still open for the convenience of the departing fleet, he bought a seaman's biscuit. With this he returned to the harbour by way of the shore. At the slip by the rocket-house he went down to the beach, and searched among the shingle until he found a stone like a dumbbell, large at the ends and narrow in the middle. Then he went back to the quay. The dog followed him and watched him. The last of the boats was out in the bay by this time. She could be seen quite plainly in the moonlight with the green blade of a wave breaking on her quarter. Somebody was carrying a light on her deck, and the giant shadow of a man's figure was cast up on the new lug cell. There were shouts and answers across the splashing water. Then a fresh young voice on the boat began to sing, Lovely Mona, fare thee well. The women took it up, and the two companies sang it in turns, verse by verse, the women on the quay and the men on the boat, with the sea growing wider between them. An old fisherman on the skirts of the crowd had a little girl on his shoulder. "'You'll not be going to Kinsale this time, mate,' said a voice behind him. "'Oh, no, sir. I've seen the day, though. Thirty years I was going, and better. But I'm done now.' "'Well, that's the way, you see. It's the turn of the young ones now. Let them sing, God bless them. We're not going to fret, though, are we? There's one thing we can always do. We can always remember. And that's some constellation, isn't it?' I'm doing it regular, said the old fisherman. After all, it's been a good thing to live, and when a man's time comes, it'll not be such a darn bad thing to die, neither. Don't you hold with me there, mate? I do, sir, I do. The last boat had rounded the castle rock, and its topsail had diminished and disappeared. On the quay the song had ended, and the women and children were turning their faces with a shade of sadness towards the town. Well, with a deep universal inspiration... Wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it? Then what are you crying about? The girls laughed at each other with wet eyes, and went off with springless steps. 
the mothers picked up their children and carried them home whimpering, and the old men went away with drooping heads and shambling feet. When all was gone and the harbour-master had taken his last look round, the man with the dog went to the end of the empty quay and sat on the mooring-post that had served for the running of the ropes. All was quiet enough now. The voices, the singing, the laughter were lost. There was no sound but the gurgle of the ebbing tide, which was racing out with the river's flow between the pier and the castle rock. The man looked at his dog, stooped to it, gave it the biscuit, and petted it and stroked it while it munched its supper. Dempster, boch, Dempster, getting old, eh? Travel far together, haven't we? Tired a bit, aren't you? Couldn't go through another rough journey anyway. Hard to part, though. McCree, McCree. He took the stone out of his pocket, tied it to one end of the string, made a noose on the other end, slipped it about the dog's neck, and without warning picked up the dog and stone at once, and dropped them over the pier. The old creature gave a piteous cry as it descended. There was a splash, and then the racing of the water past the pier. The man had turned away quickly, and was going heavily along the quay. End of Part 6, Chapter 19